Okay, so um, well, at the end of uh, 2012, it was very exciting because um, the Nobel Prize was awarded for the first time um, to an area of, uh, of physics that's the technology, technologies behind uh, quantum computing. Um, so we definitely wanted to cover these areas uh, during the Q Plus Hangouts um, this year. So uh, we're very happy to have as a speaker today um, Dietrich Liebfried, who is um, the uh, co-leader of the group uh, who studies quantum information in ion traps at the National Institute of Standards and Technologies. Um, he's a close colleague of uh, David Weinlands, who, who was one of the Nobel recipients. Um, their association goes back to 1995 when he was a postdoc at, uh, at NIST. Um, he later moved uh, as an associate professor to Innsbruck uh, before finally moving back to NIST in 2001. Um, he's a very distinguished scientist who has many publications and is a fellow of the American Physical Society. Um, and today he's going to tell us about um, ion traps for quantum computing and quantum simulation. So over to you. All right, so thanks for the introduction, Matt, and thanks for inviting me to give this talk. This will be a somewhat new experience for me, so if there are any technical hitches, please forgive me. I'll try to do my best, but we'll see how it goes. So as Matt already said, I'm basically standing in for Dave Weinland, who I've hardly seen since the Nobel Prize thing happened. So I think Steve too once said the best way to get rid of your competition is to get them a Nobel Prize because after that there's no way you can do science again, it seems, or we'll see about that. But in any case, if any of you is interested in seeing Dave's original talk, since you're all web savvy, you can go to the Noble website and it's you can stream <coughs> it from there. All right, so I guess maybe the focus shifted now. I'm not sure. So anyway, I'll just go straight ahead from here. I'll give sort of my own version of the talk, which highlights more the more recent things that have happened. Rather OK, somebody uh, needs to mute yeah. their microphone. OK. Yeah. What's happening? All right. <laughs> OK, now it's good, I think. All right, so I'll now switch over to my few graphs. OK, so here you can see the introductory slide. And it's. I originally thought I can tell you about quantum information processing and a bit of quantum simulation with trapped ions today, but I think after timing the talk, maybe the quantum simulation will not work out. It depends on how quickly we can proceed here. So without further ado, I'll go to the main, one of the main characters of the talk here, if I could. OK, here we go. So we are mostly concerned with trapped ions. And just to give you an idea of the physics behind them, obviously ions have a positive charge. So you can couple to electric fields. And that allows for two things with trapped ions. One is you can build very deep traps and confine them very stiffly. So they have high emotional frequencies. And you can also grab onto them and jerk them from one place to another. So you can transport this, these ions. And finally, because they repel each other strongly, you have the Coulomb interaction between them. And that allows for quantum gates, ultimately, as we will learn a little further into the talk. The next thing ions have is they have an electron shell. And this is very nice, because on the one hand, we can grab onto the electron and drive laser transitions. And that allows for laser cooling. And we can also couple to a very good bath here, or basically a zero temperature bath, the electromagnetic vacuum. And that allows for optical pumping and state preparation. And finally, at least our version of ions has the nuclear spin is important because we're using hyperfine ground states. So these hyperfine ground states, they are very well isolated, again, by the electron shell. And this gives them co exceptionally large coherence times. 
So in other experiments that basically exploited beryllium ions as a clock, there were, we've basically seen up to 10 minutes of coherence time. So before the whole quest for quantum computing started, the state of the art was that the motional and the electronic and hyperfine degrees of freedom of ions are completely controllable at the quantum level. And that gave some people an idea how you could actually exploit that for quantum information as well. And these two were Peter Soller over here and Ignacio Sirac. They basically asked themselves the question, can we couple ion qubits? And they found a way to do that. And it's in this seminal paper in, in our particular field, quantum computations with cold trapped ions. What they realized is that it's pretty hopeless to couple spins directly in ions. But since they strongly repel each other in such an ion trap, they share a degree of freedom, the motion. And this motion can be quantized as well. And at the time, laser cooling to the ground state of this quantum harmonic oscillator was already possible. So they said, OK, if we can cool to the ground state, we can use this as something like a bus so the ions can talk to each other. And how this works in more detail, I'll, I'll talk about it. But that's the basic idea that they brought to the table, that we can use the shared eigenmodes of oscillation in such an ion trap to get qubit-qubit coupling. So the spins are never directly coupled. You actually use the motion, and you have to do a little bit of a roundabout to do that. But in any case, that was the seed idea for the field. And in fact, since this idea came about, you can see here that the number of groups that works with ion traps has almost exponentially scaled up. So a lot of people joined the party here. And of course, that's a very nice thing for a field when you can see that there's actually growth. Because before Sirac and Soler's ideas, ion traps were essentially just something to do clocks with. And it was almost a stagnating field. Dave Weinland sometimes says that Sirac and Soler have erected ion traps from their deathbed. So anyway, this is the score here. And now let's go into the details a little more. Basically, what we want to do, and I don't have to dwell on this very long, is we want to build a quantum information processing system. And David DiVincenzo has very nicely laid out what we need. And it turns out that in ion traps, almost everything is there. But the main problem we have and we share this problem with many other approaches, is that we need a scalable physical system. So we somehow have to find a way to make all the parts in our system reliable enough and high fidelity enough and also reproducible enough that we can scale it up. How to do that, we will talk about in a minute. But let me first give you a, a little bit of a flavor of how ion traps actually work. So basically, since you can't produce a real minimum with a static field, we have to do a little trick in ion traps. We use a radio frequency field. So what we do is we apply radio frequency to two opposing electrodes in such a three-dimensional geometry here. We apply this RF here. And then if we put DC on these two electrodes, you can imagine at the very center here where the details of these electrodes are not important you get a quadrupole field. And that wouldn't help on its own, because this quadrupole field basically looks like a saddle. And so this saddle is not able to trap an ion. But now if this quadrupole flaps around quickly, because it's radio frequency, it's typically at several 10 megahertz, the ions are actually not fast enough to ever roll down the saddle. And therefore, what the ion sees is a pseudo potential. And if you time average over one of these oscillations of the radio frequency field, you actually end up with a harmonic time average pseudo potential. So along the radial directions here, we are confined by a harmonic potential. And the question now is, how can we plug the ends here so the ions don't roll out at the ends of the trap? And this is done by using DC electrodes. Now I only have to plug one dimension, and it's fine to use static fields for that. Basically, what we do is we make these, this and this electrode, and also the opposing ones, so here and here. We make those at a higher potential than the middle electrode. And that also leads to a to first order harmonic axial potential. 
Now, of course, we want to work with several ions, and we can play a trick here. If we make this radial potential much stronger than the axial potential, we will have a radial confinement that's much stronger than the axial confinement, and that means that the ions will align along the trap axis. So basically what you can think of is you take a tube and you put some marbles in, and then you just bend the ends of the tube slightly up, and what will happen is that the marbles will align along the lowest line in the tube, and that's pretty much what the ions do as well. Because of the Coulomb interaction, we can couple these ions couple to each other, so rather than thinking that is this ion will move and these two don't care about it, you want to think about normal modes. So, for example, for free ions, like it's shown here, you get three normal modes, the center of mass, the stretch mode, and a mode that we call Egyptian, because the head here in the middle is moving opposite to the hands, so it looks a little bit like this Egyptian dance. So these normal modes are very important, because, as you can see, you share them between all these three ions in this case, and therefore there are a degree of freedom that talks to all of them, and this will allow us to do two qubit gates in the end. Now, what are our qubits? There are basically two flavors of ion qubits that are heavily used these days. One is what we call the hyperfine qubit. So in this case, you take one of, or two of the many hyperfine ground states in, in an ion. It can be different species, beryllium, magnesium, calcium, and so on. We are typically working with beryllium and magnesium at NIST. And if you take two of these ground states, they're typically a few gigahertz apart, between 1.2 and something like 20 gigahertz in, in mercury. And these two can form pure qubit. The laser cooling and the detection is done by using lasers that can actually couple to an excited p-state here. So here you're really promoting the electron into an excited state, and that allows for laser cooling and detection. I'll talk about that a little more. There are also optical qubits, for example, calcium-40, calcium-43, strontium, for example, several isotopes as well, terbium, and so on. So for these optical qubits, you take advantage of a low-lying d-state. These d-states are present in the heavier ions. For beryllium, the d-state is above the p-state, so you don't have this opportunity. But for calcium, for example, there is a low-lying d-state that has a very long lifetime about a second or so, and so you can use these two as your qubit. Typically, the spacing here is a few hundred terahertz, so you're truly talking about optical frequencies. And laser cooling and detection is again done with the p-states, because there you don't want a long lifetime. You want to be able to make this transition cycle very quickly and scatter many photons, so you can cool and detect. I'll talk a little more about the details. So for the details here, for state preparation, again, we can take advantage of coupling to the p-levels here. So these excited states have typically a few nanoseconds of lifetime, and so I can cycle photons very quickly. If you imagine I'm somewhere in these ground states here, and I shine in a laser that's polarized sigma plus, it can always go to the right-hand side, but not to the left-hand side when the ion gets excited. So even if it decays back here for the first time, eventually it will decay to this state, and then it can be excited again by the sigma plus, and it can decay here, and you just keep going until you reach a cycling transition here. So this allows you to optically pump for state preparation, because once everything's been said and done, you shut the laser off, the ion will almost certainly be in this outermost state here. And so this allows for state preparation. Moreover, this is a closed transition here, and we can now play a little trick that we call Doppler cooling. So instead of shining in the sigma plus light exactly resonant with this level here, we detune it red by about half a line width, which is the width of this excited state. It has a finite lifetime, therefore this level has a certain width. For Doppler cooling, you typically go to half of that line width, and since your ions are ready tuned, the following happens in a very crude picture. If the ions flying towards the laser beam, the laser beam looks blue detuned by the Doppler effect. That's where the name Doppler cooling comes from. And 
these retitune photons, since they are seen a little blue detuned, are more likely to be absorbed head on by the ion. So the ion will be basically slowed down because the re emission process can go anywhere. It's pretty isotropic in most of these cooling schemes. So basically, you always take hits to your head, but when you recoil by emission, these are averaged out over all directions, and you only get a diffusive motion from that. So typically, you have one kick that opposes the motion, and the other kicks average out. And you can cool to a limit of about 3 to 10. That's basically given by this diffusive motion of the re-emission. And this is just one of the tricks, the Doppler cooling. But we also have a trick called resolved sideband cooling. It works very similarly. Again, you just take the right photons in absorption and then in emission. You hope that nothing bad happens. And in this way, you can even cool to the ground state. How this is done is a little more involved, and I'll actually come to a, an example later on. But for just understanding how cooling works, this Doppler cooling gives a pretty good idea. So finally, we would like to detect our states. For the optical transitions, it works very similarly, but I'll just go through it for the beryllium here, where this is a hyperfine ground state qubit. The splitting between our two qubit states here is 1.2 gigahertz. So this is one choice we can make, the 2 minus 2 and 1 minus 1 of the S1 half level. And that's the last time you have to put up with this atomic physics notations. So basically, we just call this spin up and this one spin down. Now if we shine in a resonant laser from the 2 minus 2 to the P3 halves, this state width up here is about 20 megahertz, so it's much smaller than 1.2 gigahertz. And that means if I'm in this qubit state here, this driving field basically goes nowhere. It just can't really connect with anything. It's far off resonance. But this driving field here can connect with the P3 halves, 3 minus 3 state. And that gives you a cycling transition, because the only way you can decay here is back to where you came from. And you can scatter millions of photons in this way. What you basically get from such a transition is you can, depending on what your qubit state is, make the ion bright or dark. And you can really see here, this is a register of three ions. And you can controllably make one of the ions dark by just promoting it to this qubit state. And then when you detect, you see the outcome in a truly digital fashion, bright or dark. So this is how we measure our qubit states. For the coherent interactions, again, I have to distinguish between the hyperfine qubit and the optical qubit, but not very much, it turns out. Since this splitting here is only a few gigahertz, but we would like to use laser beams, we resort to a trick that call, that's called Raman transitions. So we take two light fields and make their difference frequency coincide with these few gigahertz here. So it's two beams that are detuned by a few gigahertz. And by going through a virtual state close to the P state up here, so we have some detuning on the order of tens of gigahertz, typically, you can promote the ion from one qubit state to the other, and you can do that fairly coherently. Later on, I'll also talk about direct microwave manipulation of the qubits. So you just shine in 1.2 gigahertz, and why that hasn't been so fashionable so far, but it's becoming more fashionable now. But the first, the tool that people used pretty much in the last 10 years are Raman transitions for hyperfine states. And since they are ground states, they are very long-lived. And you can also get very long T2s on the order of 10 seconds or so. For the optical qubits, the game is a little different. Here you can use just one laser. You can directly go to the D state. The only little drawback is that you need a very good laser for that, because you have to have absolute frequency stability at a few hundred terahertz. So you need basically the best lasers you can build to do this. In the hyperfine qubits, you only have to keep the difference constant. If the overall laser frequency is changing a little bit, that just changes the detuning. So that's, from the laser building standpoint, a little easier. But in any case, the optical qubits have also made very great strides. And I'll touch on this a little bit later. So it's by no means clear which one is the proper approach in the end. All right. So the thing to stress here is that once you forget about it's two photons here and it's one photon here, 
the excitation spectrum for an ion in a trap looks very similar. You get direct qubit excitations that we call a carrier, and you can also get excitations that change the qubit state and change the state of the motion that we typically call sidebands. And exactly the same thing happens for the optical qubits here. And these are basically our main tools to get things happening. So to understand how two qubit gates works these days, you can actually do that in a unified picture. And it basically depends on the fact that you can have state-dependent excitation of an harmonic oscillator. The simplest idea here is the following. Suppose I have one light field at omega light here, and then I superimpose another light field. So this simple single field already would create an AC Stark shift on, the, on this atom here, and therefore exerts a light field. This is may be known to some of you from optical dipole traps. That's exactly what you use for optical dipole traps. Now if I take a second light field and I detune it a little bit, I get almost a standing wave, but not quite. Because I'm detuned by the trap frequency, you can think of this as a slowly walking standing wave, slowly relative to the light frequency here, which is many terahertz. But the trap frequency is probably a few megahertz. So you basically have a light field that exerts an AC Stark shift and therefore a force onto the ion that's resonant with the ion's motion. And because of the speed between these two fields, you can basically excite the ion. So the ion will start to oscillate because you push it around at its resonance, just like you push a swing. Now, if you have an ion in a superposition of spin states, these AC Stark shifts can have a different sign, for example. And so this is really hard to draw because we're talking about quantum mechanics and we are limited to classical pictures here. But basically, if you're in a superposition of spin up and spin down, the spin up and the spin down part of the wave function would actually oscillate out of phase. And this gives us a spin dependent force onto the ion which allows us to drive the motion. And this is really the basic idea how we can get gates going. And it turns also out if you have magnetic field gradients that can go onto the magnetic moment of these ions, you can also do that. But it's a lot harder to get sufficient magnetic field gradients. I'll talk about that a little later. In any case, be it magnetic or optical fields, the idea now is the following. Suppose I have two ions, and they are either in either of these four possible basis states of the qubits, so any kind of super position of these two qubits can be written as a combination of these basis states. And now I apply a force that is in resonance with the stretch mode. So the ions want to move apart and together. Now on in this case and in this case I have two equal forces. So all I can do is displace the whole crystal a little bit, but I can never pull the ions apart or push them together. While in these two cases here, I have forces that oppose each other, here and here, and therefore I can pull the ions apart and together. So if I shine in this resonant state-dependent force now, in the case here and here, I'll get nothing. But in these two cases, the ions actually will get excited. So that's drawn schematically here. So here I can excite the motion, and in these two cases, I can't. And the only trick I have to do now is I don't do this exactly resonant, so the swing goes higher and higher and higher. That would be the resonant case. But I go a little bit off resonant. And so after a while, the pushing force will be out of sync with the swinging ions. And therefore, you will start to break them down. And basically, exactly after one a time of 1 over the detuning, you will have completely undone what you initially started by pushing the ions, and the ions will be at rest again. You can draw this in phase space. And in phase space, it looks like this. You basically start the motion. You get some excitation. You go around the loop. And in the end, you will come back to where you came from. And this only happens for the states that have opposite spins. And for these, you will get a geometric phase here in phase space. It's basically just the area in phase space that you circumscribed when you did this push. And this will add on in front of the wave function in this and in that case, while for the two equal spins, nothing will happen. 
So now I have a face here for two of the cases and no face for the other two, and it turns out this is a universal face gate. Now the only thing to know is that you can do this in different bases. The ways I talked to you about it, because it's the simplest to understand, was in spin up and spin down, so the direct qubit measurement bases. But there's another flavor of this gate called the Merlman Sorensen gate, after the guys who first proposed it. And there you just have to go into the plus minus bases, so two states on the equator that point in the negative or positive x direction. And if you look at the gate in this basis here, it looks exactly the same way. So you can always understand it like that, but only if you change bases. And this has been the workhorse for many ion trap experiments. Basically, the first time this was implemented was in 2000, and a lot of other things happened in the meantime. There's more theoretical work on it, and maybe most notably, a very high fidelity has been reached on an optical qubit, calcium-40, in Innsbruck. And you can read about it in this publication. It's 99.3%. And as far as I know, this is the highest fidelity two-qubit gate that exists right now. But maybe somebody has better information. So in any case, the fidelities that people typically see is between 97 and 99.3%. The gate times are on the order of tens of microseconds which corresponds to about 25 to 41 oscillation periods. So it's fairly swift, but as you see, maybe, or as you can guess, it's limited by, by what the trap frequencies are. I should also mention that the same techniques, oops, the same techniques can be applied to more ions, so you can actually do n-particle entanglement, teleportation, free qubit error correction, and whatnot. A lot of experiments based on these gates have been done in the last six years or so. And there's a lot of literature if you're interested. All right, so we have all the ingredients to do single qubit rotations and two qubit gates and measurement and so on. Now how can we scale this whole thing up? There are many proposals to do this. And one of the early ones by Rolf DeVoe and co-workers was to use optical cavities as interconnects so here, you wouldn't actually use the motion of the ions. You would use another harmonic oscillator mediated by optical cavities to connect different ions. Another idea that, again, used the motions, but in a slightly different way, was brought forward by Sirac and Soller in 2000, where you have one ion that acts like a head. So you can think of it a little bit like a solid state drive version of an ion trap computer. The head would basically be entangled with this ion, for example, then it would move to some other ion, say this guy here, and it could then entangle with this ion. And so at this point, you have shared entanglement between these two guys. And you can pretty much universally compute. It's not very parallel, as you can see, or you would need a lot of heads to make it parallel. But it's some principal idea. Another idea, again, based on photons, but now in, so to speak, a poor man's cavity is something that goes back to Lu Ming Duan and Chris Monroe and co-workers. Here the idea is basically that if you have two emission events from two distant ions and you combine them on a beam splitter, you can look at the pattern of clicks you get here. And it turns out if you do this in the right way, you get, get heralded entanglement. You might have to try many times, but at some point you'll get the right pattern of clicks here, and you know this and this ion has been entangled. And then you can repeat this with other ions, and in this way build up entanglement, for example, for a cluster state, and get universal computation in this way as well. Now, finally, after telling you there are many ideas about it, I'll go to what we actually follow at NIST. And this is basically what we call the multiplex trap approach. Originally, Sirac and Soler envisioned to have very many ions in just one trap. And that turns out to be a little messy, because for each ion you add into this trap, you get three more emotional modes. And this spectrum of emotional mode get modes gets very dense and messy very quickly. So the main idea of this scheme here is to actually use many small traps that you can connect together rather than one big trap. So in each small trap at a given time, there are only a few ions. 
and they have an emotional mode spectrum that's fairly easy to understand. So just to go through a basic example here, what you would do is, if these are your qubits, you would basically change electric fields on these control electrodes along here, and you can push the ions around in this way. So you would basically go like this. You take this first ion here and bring it in here. The second ion you want to give a rest for now, but the third one you put in here as well. Now you've moved these ions around, and that might mean their motion is excited. Not necessarily, but it could. And here's the trick for that. You can make use of the fact that these ions are coupling by their charge, so I can put a different species ion in here, and the charge will still couple it just as strongly to these as if it were the same type of ion. This different ion listens to different lasers, and therefore I can now laser cool this different ion. I can put lasers on, but the two qubit ions don't really care about these lasers. They're very, very far off resonant, and you can calculate the effects. They're pretty negligible. However, the motion will be cooled, and therefore I can initialize the motion of this free ion two qubit register into a good state. And now, after doing that, I can use the standard gates, for example, a Melmo Sorensen gate or something like that, to perform a two qubit gate between these two guys. The only time the motion really comes into play is when the ions get excited in phase space, but then you bring them back to the origin, and they are not excited anymore. And that means the motion factors out after that. And therefore, I can now take these two qubits and move them around again. The motional wave function factors out from the qubit state. I can do these things without really, or at least we hope, without disturbing the qubit information too much. And now I could, for example, do a single qubit rotation on this guy here. Of course, I've brought the other one far away. It's nicely isolated, and I can do the single qubit rotation. In this register, I may, might maybe wish to do a measurement. So instead of using a Raman laser or something like that here, or a laser to the D state, I use a readout laser to the P state, directly resonant, and one of the ions will maybe heavily fluoresce. The other one was in the other qubit state, so it doesn't fluoresce. So here I get one of them was dark and one of them was bright. And this was possibly ancilla qubits for some error correction. And based on the read of the ancilla, I could now do something here, and so on and so forth. So basically, now I can bring in new ions, and the game starts all over. That's the basic idea how this is supposed to work. Now, how far are we really in, in reality? And of course, the things are pretty modest. Once you look at reality, we basically work in traps like this. And this is a trap that John Jost, who is possibly in the audience today, built at NIST. And we are using it as our workhorse trap to show these scalable primitives, basically. This trap has six zones that we can really use. And in the end of the day, at the end of the day, we are only using three zones. And they are basically marked. A and B here, those are the workhorse zones. And then we have one far off where we can put ions in if we want to have them out of the way. But in any case, for most of it, we're just in these two zones. And we can either combine the two ions in these zones or separate them. And the electrode here in the middle, that serves as a separation electrode. So basically, we can start out by having both ions over electrode 8, for example, A. Sorry, just one ion. I have to say one more thing here. I already talked about these cooling ions, and our little primitive experiment has cooling ions. So these green ions here are the two magnesium cooling ions, and these red ions here are the beryllium qubit ions. So each of these you can think of as a qubit and fridge package. The magnesium is the fridge. It allows you to cool the motional state to the ground state, so you can use it for two qubit gates. And uh, beryllium actually carries the information of the qubit. Now, what we would like to do in this experiment is to benchmark a scalable primitive. And it's pretty hard to come up with something that could work in any quantum computer. But what one thing you can actually implement for benchmarking scalable primitives is what people call a Clifford unitary. It's a certain subgroup of all unitary rotations called the Clifford rotations. 
And they're typically made up out of several two qubit gates and single qubit gates. And we can pick these guys at random and then do a benchmark over these random Clifford unitaries. This is called randomized benchmarking, the technique. So suppose I have this Clifford unitary here. I basically, on a classical computer, have to come up with a way how to implement it on my particular quantum computer. So for the Eintracht quantum computer, this looked like the following. First, I do a single qubit rotation in position B while the ions are apart. Then I bring them together here, do a two qubit gate. Then I move them apart again, do two qubit, two single qubit rotations in these separate zones, move them together again, do move them apart after this two qubit gate, do single qubit rotations, and so on and so on. So basically, I can take this Clifford unitary, create some machine code that's particular to my Eintrap machine here, and then I can implement it using these packages here. And that's basically what we've done. Physically, when you look at the moving ions, they just come together for two qubit gates, they move apart. For single qubit gates, they come together, and so on and so forth. So how well can we do this? Basically, we can't do it very well. We could only repeat the Clifford unitaries that are still made up out of several gates six times. And you can see that the fidelity actually drops quite quickly. So we don't have perfect fidelity to begin with because of preparation and readout errors, sometimes called spam errors. So we don't start at 1, we start at 0.9. And then with each Clifford unitary that we add, we lose a little bit. The nice thing about Clifford unitaries is that if you think about their error behavior, if you just do enough of them, they do a phenomenon called Clifford twirling, which means any error you get in the end looks like depolarization and should lead to exponential decay in the fidelity to uh, joint fidelity that would, in this case, asymptotically go to 0.25 because it's two qubits. So if you think about all the possibilities, you're in a completely mixed state the fidelity with an arbitrary state should be 0.25, and that's where this should asymptotically go to. In any case, there is a nice twist to this Clifford randomized benchmarking. You can intersperse some gate of interest, and in our case, this was this gate here. We This was a Merle Sorensen gate that we used for the first time in our lab, and we would have liked to know how well we can do it. So you can intersperse it. And what you can see is, of course, the fidelity drops even more because you're doing one two qubit gate. But you can compare the decay of this curve. So it's only an offset. And also, it's a favorable scaling versus the process tomography, for example. Is there a question? No, I guess not. All right. So as I said, we implemented this with up to six random Clifford unitaries. And the take home message here is our gate is not very good. We have to be much better to even get close to something fault tolerant. Now you can say, OK, the Innsbruck guys are doing a better job. They're doing a gate with less than a percent of error. But in, at the end of the day, you would go to like 10 to the minus 4, and we are far away from that. 
no matter which implementation you think about. Also, doing such an experiment where basically all the primitives, the cooling and the moving and all that was involved, has some technical limitations. And this became very clear in this experiment. If you look at a pie chart of how much time we used for the different operations, you will see that the moving and the cooling was by far most of the time used in this algorithm. Then there was some classical computing overhead where just our classical PC controller of the experiment had to decide what to do and how the pulses will come out of some FPGAs and so on. And so that was quite sizable. But the gate pulses themselves, so when you actually did some quantum information processing, that was a very small part of the whole business. And so clearly we have to do something about this. 81% of the time we spent just with transport and cooling of, of this, these ions in the scalable algorithm implementations. So in the last two years or so, we've concentrated on improving that. And we haven't gotten back to actually implement these improvements back into our little benchmark experiment. That will probably come at some point. But we haven't done it, so I can only tell you about these experiments on their own. The first thing was we just had a technical limitation in our original waveforms that moved the ions around. They basically had a clock rate of 500 kilohertz, which meant these ions were kind of slowly going along here, much slower than, for example, the motional frequency or 1 over the motional frequency. So the transport time was on the order of good fractions of milliseconds. and uh, Oscillation time is something like 100 nanoseconds to a microsecond or so, much slower. This has been changed by now up going to waveform generators. These are basically digital to analog converters with a 50 megahertz update rate. And Ryan Bowler has done a great job in getting those to work. With these, we can now try to transport much faster. There's just one little hitch here. If you have unequal mass ions, you will always excite both normal modes of the motion. Because as you can see, there is an in phase and an out of phase. So it looks a little bit like the center of mass and stretch. But there's always a center of mass component, no matter what you do. So if you try to jerk the center of mass around, you'll excite both of these modes. So you can not play tricks where the motion just returns in phase space, because the frequencies of the in-phase and the out-of-phase mode are incommensurable. So you won't find a place where they both come back after you excited them, and you can somehow catch them in the right way. In any case, what you can do is you can use error function type accelerations that are fairly smooth and still look almost adiabatic, even if you're very close to the diabatic limit. And use, using these, this is for a two Ion different species crystal. This is just some flopping that shows the experts that we're pretty close to the ground state. In numbers here, the in phase mode was at an n bar of 0.23, and the out of phase mode was at an n bar of 0.3. So predominantly in the ground state, both of them. And this was with 16 microseconds transport time over a 370 micron distance. This is just a distance to go from here to here. And so we're pretty hopeful that we can cut the transport time at least by a factor of 10 or so in the future. For the cooling, there's also a trick for that. There's basically a variation of ground state cooling called EIT cooling. This has been fashionable for a very short time, in two th around 2000. It has been demonstrated with a single ion at the University of Innsbruck. And the basic idea here is the following. Suppose you have a free level system. So if you do this with magnesium 24, you would use two of the S1 half ground states and one of the excited states. There is a fourth state around here, and that will have some consequences. But for the first order, think about these free states. If you had ideally free states, and you shine in these two lasers with the right kind of power, relative power and tuning, you basically get what people call a Fano profile. And the idea is that if these two lasers here are exactly in resonance, you get something like a Raman transition. So their splitting has to be exactly like the level splitting here. And this creates a so-called dark resonance. So the scattering profile, assume there's a third weak laser 
that tries to now scatter from the ion will actually have no scattering whatsoever. It's completely transparent here. Electromagnetically induced transparency happens here. And so you just can't scatter here. And if you had the ion somehow nailed to the trap, so it's completely at rest, it would just go here to the stark resonance and never scatter a photon again. But in reality, the ion's actually moving a little bit because it's not completely in the ground state. So basically, that motion means that the dark state is disturbed a little bit. It's very similar to velocity selective coherent population trapping in neutral atoms. And you can actually then scatter on this peak here because if you do everything right with your lasers, this narrow peak here will coincide with the trap frequency. So this is basically a sideband transition of the moving ion, and this would be the ion at rest. So while the ion's moving, oops, it can scatter on this sideband, and it will not scatter on the carrier when it's not moving anymore, and in this way you can get very close to the ground state. This is very hand-waving. You can read about the theory in these papers here. It's pretty involved. The main message I have is that it actually works, and this might look narrow here, but it's actually much wider than the typical sideband transitions. So you can actually use it to cool several modes at the same time. This is shown here. This is an experiment on four ions, so it would be the typical confirmation before we try to do a two-qubit gate. And you can see, depending on a certain AC stark shift in this scheme that sets up where exactly the dark resonance and the sprite resonance are, you can cool all these modes together to a fairly low temperature. And we only modified this. This would be cooling with just one pulse. We modified it slightly to use two pulses. But in any case, the long story short is that with the EIT cooling, we can cool in about 60 microseconds to an n-bar of roughly 0.2. And the nice thing is, since we are so close to resonance here, we need very little laser power. So the cooling time is down by a factor of 10. The laser power is down by even more than a factor of 10 compared to our previous resolved sidebands. And this is basically brought about because the detuning of these lasers is much closer than in the resolved sideband case. This fourth level actually has a consequence. You can see it here. If you calculate the ideal free level simulation, you would get to lower and lower n bars. So we should do much better than what we see here. But this fourth level kind of spoils the party. We can't make this delta larger and larger to go lower, because the fourth level will at some point go into resonance and then resonantly scatter. And as you can see, here we are at an n bar of almost 1. So all we can do is work around here, and that's pretty much the results we get. All right. So with this, I will go to some more new things here. And this is surface electrode traps, what you can do with those. We are basically done with the algorithms and so on. And I'll move on to, to this. So what are surface electrode traps? Basically, the idea here is that we would like to build our traps in a much simpler way. If you looked at John Joe's trap a while ago, it was a fairly complicated thing. It needed a lot of manual adjustment. And John worked for about a year just to build it. We would like to use microfabrication. But that's basically a 2D technology. So we have to make things a lot simpler. It turns out that you can do this. If you give up the idea that you get a very nice quadrupole over a very large volume, you can actually just try to get it in a small volume. And for that, some fake electrodes in just one plane will do. So the idea here is the following. Suppose I put radio frequency on this electrode and that electrode in a plane, and I ground these other two. If I just make a snapshot of the electric fields, I'll get lines like these here. And you can see I have, on the one hand, the lines that go from here to here and from here to here. And then finally, I also have much longer lines that go, say, from here to here and so on. They are in competition. And at some point, they'll just average, or sorry, they'll just cancel out. And at least very locally around that point, I'll get a quarter pole. And as long as I cool my ions nicely and they can never explore what's going on out here or out here, it will look to them like they're still in a harmonic pseudo potential. This is shown here. You can see here, I still get a pretty nice round thing. And 
once I deviate from that, I'll eventually get to a saddle point and the iron will just rush out. But to first order, if I don't go too far and I explore my neighborhood, not too much. It looks like a harmonic potential. For axle confinement, you use other surface electrodes here. You basically can use this and this, for example. And this will pin the iron onto a place like here. And it turns out that you can even do junctions in this way. This is a trap that Jason Amini designed. And you can see here that for the Ponder Motive RF-induced equipotential, you get three arms here. And now you can use these DC electrodes to decide whether you want to push up this arm or up that arm and create a junction in that way. Jason has gone further and actually built a six-junction modular trap that you can see here. And basically, here we get a lot of zones. We have two load zones here, and then we have these six junctions and a lot of control electrodes. Jason mostly thought of this as a design study. Can we do such a thing in a clean room? But it turns out that this trap even loaded ions. It certainly wasn't our best trap, but it loaded ions, and Jason was able to go around two of these corners here. It had some issues, and so that's why he couldn't do a complete round. But there's more progress by other groups, for example, Sandia and GTRI, and they can now build these junctions very reliably. And we are happy that they've taken over this onerous part of microfabrication. In any case, what is allowed by the surface traps now is what we call universal microwave control. The basic idea is very simple get rid of the Raman interactions here and actually use directly 1 to 2 gigahertz, in our case, to couple the qubit states. If you can do this, there's no spontaneous emission from the p-state because the Raman lasers that promoted you through the p-states can lead to spontaneous emission. Here, you never go anywhere near a p-state, so no problem with that. Also, microwaves at, in this frequency range are in every cell phone. So there's a very nice suit of nice, precise classical control. People really know how to engineer microwaves. Another advantage is that you can put your antennas directly on the chip. It's just some wire on the chip, basically. That's your antenna. You'll see an example of that in a minute. And therefore, the control will scale with the trap structure. While if you use lasers and you, have, you scale from 10 to 100 zones, you now need 100 laser beams, and you have to produce them off the chip. If it's just a wire on the chip, it will scale with the chip itself. And finally, for reasons that I'll explain in a sec, Doppler cooling is sufficient for doing two qubit gates in, in this scenario. So why haven't people done this all the time? Why have they actually bothered with Raman lasers and stuff like that? The answer is that you need gradients for doing two qubit gates. You basically want to force the motion. With light fields, that's pretty easy because you have wavelengths on the order of, say, 300 nanometers or so. And these have to have a sufficiently large gradient on the scale of the harmonic oscillator ground state wave function, which is on the order of 10 nanometers. So 300 nanometers, 10 nanometers, that's not too different. And you actually get a sizable force. The parameter that compares this wavelength or k-vector to the ground state is actually the Lambdicky parameter that might be familiar to some of you. And so everything's fine with light fields. Now, if you think about magnetic microwave fields, the wavelength's much longer, and this number here becomes very small. However, you can play a trick. If you can go very near to, to a conductor, say a wire here, you can think about the BOSOR's law. The field of this conductor will drop as 1 over d. The gradient of the field will simply drop as proportional to 1 over d squared. So now the two sizes to compare are the ground state wave function, 10 nanometers, and this distance here. I can basically put this in a table. For the plane wave, as I already said, it's pretty hopeless because the lamp dicky would be super small, about 10 to the minus 8. If I build a trap with 1 millimeter size and put a wire a millimeter away from the ions, I would get a lamp dicky parameter that's still very small, not very useful, or this equivalence to the lamp dicky parameter. Now, if I build a 30 micron trap, that's a really microfabricated trap. This goes at least to some parts in 10 to the minus 4. And to compare this, the 
stamp Dickey parameters in typical experiments for the calcium are about 3% or 10%, depending on which experiments you talk about. So for the for this kind of trap size, you can see that the carrier to sideband ratio is still pretty small, but you can basically index the spatial structure to the trap. So I can have current carrying wires here in my trap, and I can set up a situation where I get a gradient, but at the same time at a zero, I'm at a zero crossing of the magnetic field. And so I basically only get sideband transitions if I can realize that. And so in that case, I have a sizable derivative, but no fields. And I need three wires to do that. The trap to do this in looks like this one, two, three wires here. Here you can see two magnesium ions that are about 30 microns away from the surface, trapped here. And the first thing we did here is we sent currents through these wires here and looked whether we can really produce a situation where we have no magnetic field but a strong gradient. This gives you, in this case, a quadrupole in the microwave field. If you have basically a zero, that's the quadrupole origin, and then you have gradients, that's basically how the quadrupole rises in these different places. Here we just measure an AC Seaman shift, so it's proportional to B squared, and it has, it's a little bit like the pseudo potential, but you can calculate back what kind of quadrupole you get, and indeed we get about 35 Tesla per meter gradient, and then we found that the quadrupole has a certain inclination relative to the trap plane. So that all looked good. We can do very nice single qubit rotations here because this wire is so close. All I have to do is send a current through here. And this current will basically produce an AC magnetic field at the ion. In this particular experiment, we used the first order magnetic field insensitive transition from 3, 1 to 2, 1. This becomes field insensitive at a certain magnetic field, 21.3 millitesla. You can see here, when we change the magnetic field, the frequency of the transition comes to first order field independent down here. And indeed, we can do very nice rotations here. This is basically the first few Rabi flops. It's also very fast. So the pi time here, going from here to here, for example, is 19 nanoseconds, so that's compared comparable to solid state qubits, some of them. And also the contrast stayed very high after a very long time. So this is after 260 pi pulses. Looks still pretty good. So in this case, we did a single qubit benchmark. And I can't go into all the details, but you can see here we do sequences of up to a 1,000 pulses, but the fidelity only drops by about 2% or so. So when you do the math, the infidelity per computational gate was on the order of 2 times 10 to the minus 5. And to our knowledge, this is the first time that somebody made it below this magic mark of 10 to the minus 4 that, for better or for worse, is considered a fault-tolerant limit. So there's a lot of debate about that. But in any case, it's probably a good starting place, and we can do better than that. There are some experiments done in Oxford in the meantime where they even get something on the order of almost 10 to the minus 6. And this is with calcium, so you can see this is not just a one-shot deal. This is really something that is sustainable. You can also do individual addressing with microwaves, which might be surprising because the wavelength is so long. But the idea is exactly the same as for the 2-qubit gate. If you can keep one ion where the magnetic field is zero, so here's the quadrupole just sliced, and this is the axis of zero magnetic microwave field. Now you can push the ions around in the trap a little bit, like this. So one ion goes to where the field is finite, the other ion stays at zero. And now here, if you look at the fluorescence after putting the microwave in for different times, you can see that one ion flops. So it changes its state from bright to dark, while the other ion is always bright. And there's a little bit of droop here. This gives you the rotation rate ratio. And basically here, what we see is that the ratio is about 60. So even for two ions that are only about 4 microns apart from here to here, we can isolate them fairly nicely. And you can also think about doing composite pulses. This is just the first demonstration. And so you shouldn't take this number too seriously. But we think we can do individual addressing in the end. So finally, what about the 2-qubit entanglement? 
this is shown here. Again, I would like to go to where the B field is zero, so I don't get these carrier transitions. In this case, they're undesired. But I can do sideband transitions, because I have a gradient here. And basically, what we did is a Melma Sorensen gate with microwaves. Again, for the experts here, these are the populations and the parity flopping we got. And it's not very stately, I have to say. We got an entangled state fidelity of about 76%. But this is the first time somebody tried something like that. So maybe we can get away with that. Why is it not so great? The main reason is that we are really close to the surface. Sorry, sorry Dietrich, yes. to interrupt you. I think your video is stuck on the previous slide. Oh, um, OK. I don't know if you can switch the screen sharing on and off or something. And Yeah, actually, I see I'm still in the right place. But let me try and see what, what hap happened that, here. That looks better now. Oh, so you are we back? Yeah, I think so. I think it just required going onto the screen here with the cursor for a second. So. OK, let me go back here. All right. So what we what found out is that basically we are very close to the surface. And the heating from the surface, it's basically noise fields from the surface, they heat up the motional state. And that limited our ability to do this. And so this will be the last bit of information that I'll give to you. We had to do something about the heating now. OK, now I have to go here. Because this is clearly limiting our ability to do these two qubit gates in this. And so in the last one and a half years or so, we've started to work with surf scientists to actually figure out what our nice looking gold surfaces really are like. And the first thing was a surprise. Basically, Dustin Hyde, who is working together with Dave Pappas here at NIST, they're both very good surface scientists. He looked at our gold chips, and as you see, they look like gold. But when the surface scientists look at them, they don't look at like gold at all. So this was basically a chip as it came out of the clean room. And you didn't see a lot of gold. There are just a few hints that there's gold somewhere. If you do what people call O'Shea spectroscopy, this is basically you have resonances that are element specific. But what they saw here, that the one that's specific to carbon is much stronger than the gold. And if you look at the ratio of these two peaks here, it turns out that you have about two monolayers of something containing carbon on the gold. Unfortunately, you can't do Auger with hydrogen, because you need at least two electrons to use this method. And hydrogen only has one, so it doesn't work. So it could be hydrocarbons. That's what the surface scientists guess. There's a trick they play to get clean surfaces in surface science, and that's Argon ion bombardment. So Dustin took our chip in his surface science chamber and bombarded it. And sure enough, the carbon completely vanished. And now you see enormous gold peaks. So this is the same scale, just shifted a little bit for clarity. And now this gold peak is really strong. And the carbon has essentially vanished. So there's a way to do it. And encouraged by that, in the last year, we've basically built an apparatus where we can do this argon sputtering directly on our traps. So we put in this new element here. It's what they call an argon sputter gun. It just makes argon ions and accelerates them onto the chip here. Here you can see the thing in action, because there is not only argon ions, they're also excited argon atoms. They actually shine a little bit. And you can see that shine going down into the trap like a spotlight. And at the same time, the argon ions are scrubbing it. So the recipe roughly is here. I'll spare you the details. I'll just come to the conclusion here. And that is, we've had a trap here that was fairly good to begin with. So there's a lot of heating rate data from different groups. The open symbols here are cold traps. So by cooling the traps, you can also get the heating down. The closed things are room temperature experiments. Our experiment was a room temperature experiment. So before the bombardment, we were up here. After the bombardment, we are down here. So we've reduced the heating by about a factor of 100. That's very encouraging. But we think that the Johnson noise limit, which is the next fundamental limit to the trap noise after you got rid of the surface problems, is still another factor of 100 away. So on the one hand, this is very encouraging, because we really made a difference. And now if we go back to the two qubit gate, which is one of our next plans, 
and do this cleaning, we should be able to do much better than 76% fidelity. But at the same time, there's a lot more surface science and maybe other things to be learned to really go down to the potential that these kind of traps could have. So to sum up, I, I'll probably just skip this because we're getting pretty late here. You can also integrate fibers, just to say it in, in, in a few words, and make the readout scalable as well. So once you combine all these elements, the new chip could possibly look like that, the new approach. We make more heavy use of our cooling ions in this case. So if we want to do a two qubit gate, say, we still put the two qubits in as before. But the one difference here is now, instead of shining a laser beam at the two qubits to do a Malmö Sørensen gate, say, we now excite microwaves in some of the nearby electrodes and do the ent entanglement with microwaves. And for the readout, we would do a very similar trick. We would basically now entangle the cooling ion with this ion here. And then, since we still have lasers to cool the cooling ion, we can also read out the cooling ion, and there might be a little optical fiber below this. And you might think, OK, this is kind of indirect and probably doesn't work so well. But this is actually the readout that um, quantum logic ion clocks use. And there has been a demonstration experiment in our group that shows that this readout can actually be made a quantum non-demolition readout because you can repeat it several times. The qubit's not affected by the laser that reads out this guy here. And you can reach very high fidelities. So this is possibly how this was look, would look in the future. And this is pretty much what I've got here. So you would read out the cooling ion, as I already said. To sum up now, we basically think that this near-field microwave interactions could be very useful because they provide a universal set of gates. And it seems like this could be more scalable than with lasers. We have to get our fidelities up. That's pretty clear. And so before that, I'm not going to make any bets which approach will win. But it looks at least like there's some hope. We have to improve our fidelities quite a bit, especially in the entanglement gate. We also have to reduce the heating for that. That's basically a prerequisite. Also, this first individual addressing experiment is encouraging, but you have to do a lot better than that to really make it work on a large scale. And this means we also have to solve a lot of classical control and overhead problems. So you know, if you do this with 10 to the 6 ions, it's a completely new problem. We need very strong classical control to do that. Nevertheless, we think the path forward is fairly clear in our systems, and it's just, can we technically do it? And we'll see about that in the next few years, hopefully. What has already transpired is that the most interesting physics might not necessarily come out of the QIP applications, really. It could be unforeseen things, like I briefly mentioned the quantum logic clock, which is now the best clock we have. And this was just a little side project, initially, of quantum information processing. So with that, I'll skip a few things to the end here. And of course, I've talked about a lot of work here. And it has been done by very many people. I'm just here as a spokesperson. So here they are, the Ein Storage Group at NIST. And thank you for your attention. OK, th thank you very much. Um, so we're going to have the uh, question and answer session now. So uh, if you're in the Hangout and you have a question, uh, could you please uh, put an indication in the in the chat room? Um, also, if you're watching on the live stream, you can write your questions in a comment underneath the video. Um, so so far, we've had one one in from Oxford. So if if the Oxford group wants to ask your question, hi there. Can you hear us? I can hear you. So going back to the question of scalability, do you have any sense of what an optimal number of qubits in the trap is going to be? Because you, you've shown pictures of you know, three or four uh, ions in the trap, and then you're talking about 10 to the 6. Um, yes. So within a single trap? No, here. No, I yep. don't. How many? How many do you think within a single track is going to be realistic, optimal? 
All right. So I'll first repeat the question in case not everybody has heard it so well. So the question was, you're basically doing demonstration experiments with two, or, or if you look at the experiments in Innsbruck, they have a few more, but it's certainly a few ions on the order of 10, maybe. And how can you talk about 10 to the minus 6 ions? What's the prospect of scaling it up? So as far as our idea about scaling up goes, it's certainly not going to be just one trap that holds all the 10 to the 6 ions. It would have to be a very large array. And the basic idea why we believe we can scale this up is that our little arrays that we're building today can be thought of as a little Lego piece that you can then can build into a much larger Lego structure. So the idea is if you can really make one of these pieces work very well, all, and I say this in parentheses, or in, in quotation marks, all you need to do is reproduce this little piece very, very many times, and you'll basically scale the same way as classical computers have scaled. They have a very nice thing, the, a CMOS field effect transistor, and they just scale and scale and scale it because it's so reliable. And so that's the basic idea how you would do this. And admittedly, this is far out, and even our small piece that could eventually be the building block for this is not working properly yet, so it's far out. How, just very quickly, how many ions um, do you envisage in each Lego piece? In each Lego piece, I would envisage pretty much something like what you've seen already. So. I think the Lego piece would be a two-qubit gate, some two-qubit gate, maybe the Melma Sorensen, maybe some other flavor, but basically some gate like that. And then you also want to do single-qubit rotations. And then, of course, you also need to be able to connect to other of the Lego pieces. So the transport has to happen and so on. But essentially, I would say, of course, this is not a hard number, and you could build the piece out of 10 ions as well, but I would say uh, four ions, two cooling ions, two qubit ions, that could be the basic piece. Thank you. You're welcome. OK, so um, no other questions have come up so far. If you do have a question, please indicate. Um, but I'll ask a quick one. Um, so. Uh, your talk today was focused on uh, trying to create the sort of circuit model architecture of quantum computing um, and uh, the Da Vincenzo criteria and so forth. And I was just wondering if there if there would be any advantage or possibility of um, going for other models of quantum computing with with ion traps such as measurement based computing or adiabatic quantum computing. If, has that been tried at all? Yeah, I think that's possible in principle. Uh, I think just for historical reasons, we've been very much concentrated on this. And therefore, we this, this is more or less a historical thing. However, there are quite some efforts, and I couldn't really talk about this today, unfortunately, just because there's not enough time. Oh, please, just leave me alone. All right, so anyway, that uh, the thing is that in the simulation efforts, there's a lot more things where you, for example, you're very close to this adiabatic idea. Because in the simulation, oftentimes the idea is you go from a well-known ground state, and then you go to a different state that's, uh, that is not so well-known. And so it's very close to this adiabatic idea. As far as cluster states go, I think the idea is that Lu Ming Duan and Chris Monroe and co-workers are pushing around about using photons to entangle. That would be very well suited for a cluster state approach, because you would produce entanglement in the first round, so to speak, and then you would use the entanglement as a resource in the second round and possibly do measurement-based computation. So I think these things are not out of the question. It's not essentially what we are following here. But I think the very same tools that everybody develops all over the world in ion trap groups can be pooled to do any of these approaches. And it's just a matter of what's technically most feasible. 
and maybe also what problem are you into. So for simulation, certainly the adiabatic thing, the adiabatic, in this case, simulation, is a very powerful thing to do. OK, thanks very much for that. Um, so it doesn't look like there's any more questions. This is the last call. If you have a question, please indicate now. Um, but if not, then we should uh, say thanks to Dietrich for his talk today. Um, and that's the end of the formal proceedings. Thanks to every thanks everyone for showing up. Um,